thank you. Yes, I'm speaking today about an inkjet print, print by Tracy Emmons called The Last Thing I Said to You Was Don't Leave Me Here Too. So it was printed in 2000 on a fine art inkjet paper with a porous coating. And Tate acquired this print back in 2002. And according to our records, it arrived in pristine condition and it was framed in a perfect box frame. So a problem first occurred with this print back in 2018 when a bright yellow discoloration developed on the white border of the print whilst it was on international tour and loan. So it was framed in the same Perspex box frame that it arrived in and the discoloration developed after the print had been on display for approximately 13 months. So to describe the yellow discoloration, it was acid yellow in color and it was concentrated to a specific band around the white border. The back of the print was not discolored at all. This told me that it was something to do with the ink receiving layer that was yellowing rather than the paper support itself. So most inkjet papers will have this ink receiving layer and a porous ink receiving layer is a coating which creates tiny pores for the ink to be drawn into during printing. And in the case of the Tracy Emming print, this porous coating was only on the, um, on the printed side. So why did the Tracy Emming print yellow? So the specific pattern of discoloration told me that it was likely something to do with the framing or mounting materials. And if we look at the frame construction in more detail, Inside the Perspex box frame was a wooden subframe and a double-sided adhesive film to which a piece of mount bomb was attached and the print was then float mounted to this and the Perspex box, uh, cover went over this. So again, if we look at the specific pattern of discoloration, it corresponds directly to where the wooden subframe and the adhesive film sat under the print whilst it was on display. And so the literature points to many different reasons why inkjet print can yellow, but the one that makes sense in this scenario is antioxidants. So a certain type of antioxidant known as phenolic antioxidants are thought to cause yellowing in inkjet prints, specifically inkjet prints on porous papers. Phenolic antioxidants are added to many different plastics and also acrylic adhesives, like the ones uh, used to make double-sided adhesive films. The problem with these antioxidants is that they're extremely volatile and are readily, readily absorbed into porous materials like porous inkjet papers. And when these ink antioxidants react with nitrogen dioxide in the atmosphere, they form a yellow compound and this is known as phenolic yellowing. So could phenolic yellowing be the cause of discoloration in this print? Well, we have a plastic film which likely um, had antioxidants in, the, in it. We have a porous inkjet paper which could have readily absorbed antioxidants. We have uh, nitrogen dioxide would have likely been in the atmosphere in the museum whilst the print was on display. And as the back of the frame was not sealed properly, nitrogen dioxide could have entered the frame. So I believe, considering what was written in the literature and the specific pattern of discoloration, that phenolic yellowing is the cause of discoloration in this print. But what is the solution? Well, the only conservation treatment that I've read about in the literature and discussed with other conservators is light bleaching. So this type of yellow staining is meant to be extremely fugitive to light, so it could potentially be bleached out. However, the literature also suggests that this staining could reoccur after treatment. And there is also a risk that the damage will be, um, the paper will be further damaged in the process. The other option would be to reprint. And we've approached the artist about reprinting this artwork. This might be the scenario that we go down for now, and this is because we cannot guarantee that any conservation treatment will permanently and safely remove the yellow staining. So although we think we know why this Tracy M imprint yellowed and we found a solution, a big question for me throughout the research was could this happen to other inkjet prints? And speaking to other photograph conservators in the field, many of them have also encountered similar problems. And worryingly, I've witnessed three other scenarios in the last year alone of inkjet prints yellowing at Tate. This seems to be affecting porous inkjet papers and a combination of tape or adhesive as well as interaction with airflow or pollutants seems to be the cause. And so the next question, I guess, is how big is the problem? Well, going back to the many different causes um, that outlined earlier, there seems to be so many scenarios why inkjet prints can yellow. As well as this, my experience and that of other conservators tells us that this is a common problem and it's happening right now. 
There are no clear treatment options when yellowing has occurred. And as there is an increasing number of inkjet prints coming into collections, we could see this problem happening more and more in the future. So overall, it seems to be quite a big problem for the heritage sector and one that we need to work together to find a solution to. Um, so I'd be really interested in hearing from anyone who's encountered similar problems or has any questions or wants to discuss further. So thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. And we can go to the second speaker, uh, Rasa Ahmed Sahain. Pronounce them, please. And uh, to she's a senior photograph and paper conservator at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. And uh, her first talk today is about the assessment on the photo photochemical degradation of silver gelatin photograph prints out. Rasa, yeah. you can show your screen now. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi all. Uh, this is my uh, paper uh, assessed on the photochemical degradation of silver gelatin photographs. So, uh, sorry. 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 sorry I'm sorry. So... Um. I think. Uh. Yanis is just no? okay. She's gone, but you can continue, Asha. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stop sharing. Sorry, the technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see. We can see your screen now, Asha. Okay. This is my team: uh, Dr. Mona Fuad, Dr. Osama Sark, Dr. Osama Hurida, and Dr. Ahmed uh, Labib. Uh, they are from Cairo University. Okay, uh, this is uh, my project. Uh, as we know that uh, the light is very important in the library, museums, and archives, where uh, uh, whether for displaying or storage, and uh, the all uh, light source uh, give uh, radiation in different uh, range with different energy. Uh, previous studies of uh, gelatin silver prints components uh, have shown that the components of the photographs have a great sensitivity to light, uh, particularly ultraviolet radiation, and the radiation has a cumulative uh, damage to the photochemical uh, mater photo photographic materials when the, ray when the radiation fall on the object. They give uh, amount of energy to this object, which uh, accelerate chemical and physical uh, reaction, uh, which appeared uh, to the components of this object called photochemical reactions. The damage caused by uh, ultraviolet radiation does not appear immediately where the change uh, occurs slowly and it's irreversible. As a result of significant damage caused by uh, ultraviolet on photographic material, in this research, we determine the amount of energy realized for uh, from the ultraviolet radiation needed to determine uh, de de needed to de deteriorate uh, the image in the gelatin silver photographs, which called photochemical re uh, reaction. Okay, here with the, the samples uh, preparation, two samples uh, gelatin silver photographs were prepared. Uh, the production has been controlled according to the inter, uh, international uh, standard and safe light limits was read. Develop, developer path uh, con consists of uh, salts were uh, dissolved in one liter of uh, water and uh, it's uh, shown here in the, in the table. Uh, and the fixer path consists of uh, sodium uh, thiosulfate uh, salt and potassium uh, metabisulfate salts, where it's uh, dissolved in one liter of water, dissolving in the approximately five to 10 minutes, and then placed in the dark bottle so that it's not uh, affected by the lighting. The samples were uh, subjected to the UV uh, exposing uh, cabinet which uh, consists of a set of the 10 UV fluorescent lamps at fixed dense, uh, distance from the samples. 
here uh, the result of uh, assessment uh, of mechanical degradation um, no sorry it's a tonal quality uh, qualities of the image uh, here we uh, okay here I uh, assessed the, uh, the, the color intensity and reflection, yellowing, whiting, and uh, LAB and delta E. Um, as we see here, uh, we see the, 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 degrad the, the degradation happened in the, in the, in the, in the color intensity from the standard one, and uh, that's mean um, uh, there, there is a difference between uh, in, in, in the standard and the, the, uh, the samples. On a second, please, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we can see the change in the color characteristics of the image in samples before and after exposure to UV, uh, as there is a decrease in the color intensity uh, uh, and the white test, and in increase in the value of the reflection and yellowing test. CIE lab system and system color scales shows decreasing in delta L, that's mean uh, leaking uh, plaque, uh, increasing a negative uh, in uh, delta A means excess, uh, excess of uh, in green, and uh, significant incre uh, increasing in delta B meaning excess and uh, excess uh, in yellowing. Uh, Rasa, I'm, Rasa, I'm afraid I will have to ask you to wrap it up because um, the time is almost up. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I will be quickly. Uh, here, sorry, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, about the mechanical uh, change, here we can see the decrease in the tensile uh, strength and the decrease also in the elagonate, uh, in inoculation force and uh, penetration uh, strength. Uh, here we can find the the difference between the standard and the exposed one in the uh, in the sorry the morphology of the image in the surface. Also here uh, in the IR we can find the difference here in the here in the. In this Rasa, I'm afraid I will have to I will have to stop you because it's already like past the time. <laughs> Okay, thank so, you. Okay. Sorry. Okay. No worries. Thank you very much. Stop, uh, stop sharing. Oh. Um, so the next one, um, the next one is Nicholas Barnett, uh, who is the director at the Museum Conservation Services, and he's going to be talking to us about the micograph process. Okay. Uh, Ras, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Can you see this? Can you yeah, see my can. screen? Yes, perfect. Thanks, Nicholas. Yes, good. Okay. Ten years ago, I was at an open air fair in photo fair in France. The sun was scorching. Glass plate photographs left in the sun were too hot to touch, and an unfortunate carbon print left out in direct sunlight curled up and split. Among the many camera stalls and fewer image stalls was a chap with a small table and a pile of photographs for sale. On top was an odd-looking purple photograph on silk. The vendor told me it came from an album that contained photographs by René Louis Garin, and that it was probably a self-portrait of Garin from the early 1860s. Examining the photo closely shows there is no emulsion or binder layer. The image is within the silk. It came from a sample, sorry, it came with a sample of dyed silk with a label stating purpura lapilis. Whoops, what's happened there? Um, we shot ahead. That's oh. okay. How do we go back? Oh. Okay, let's try again. So.
And let's try this. There we go. Uh, when I looked it up, it turned out to be a type of whelk, a shellfish. I thought it was likely to be a variant um, on the anthotype process. Sorry, this, because you still don't yes? show the screen. I think I think You're not? sorry, the, the the screen is not shared yet. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let's try again. Um, share screen. Okay, share. Let's go yes. back to this one. I thought it was likely to be an, a variant on the anthotype process. This process was first published by Herschel and uses dye extracted from flowers to produce a brightly coloured image. Presumably the purple dye was similarly extracted from the unfortunate mollusk. If it was a variety of anthotype, the dye would be applied to the silk, a positive image placed on top, and the stack left in the sun to destroy the exposed dye and leave an image in the protected areas. Anthotype variant isn't a bad identification attempt, but it turned out to be wrong as did the photographer and the date. Otherwise, everything was correct. So what was it, if not an anthotype variant? Eight years later, while recovering from COVID in April 2020, I was idly viewing early photographs online and came across some purple photographs on silk. Hold on, I thought, I have something like that. The purple images were mucographs by Felix Joseph Henry de la Carz de Thiers, 1821 to 1901 and had been presented to the Royal Society in 1860 to accompany a paper. Excitingly, a subsequent search for his name brought up a self-portrait in the Sorbonne that was identical to my image, Bullseye. I had to update my catalogue entry, out with Antotype, in with Mucograph, out with Garan, in with Lucas Duthias, and a slight revision of the date to 1859-1860. Professor Lucas Duthias was a French biologist, anatomist and zoologist who was an expert on mollusks. In the late 1850s, while still a young man, he was researching the biological source of the ancient dye Tyrian purple, used exclusively by the Roman emperors for their clothes. In Roman times, the dye cost 10 to 20 times its weight in gold. It was very special. Lacar's Duthias realised that the dyeing process could be adapted to produce photographs. The dye is extracted from the hypobranchial gland of mollusks of the Neurocidiae family. It starts as a colourless or whitish yellow liquid, but on exposure to light and humidity, it changes colour, becoming green, then blue as the yellow fades out, and finally becoming more red, resulting in a violet purple shade. The unexposed material is simply washed out to fix the image. In his paper presented to the Royal Society, he states that the colour change is accompanied by the development of a most penetrating and fetid odour, analogous to that of garlic oil. This isn't the way the ancient Phoenicians dyed cloth. According to Pliny, they prepared the colour first, then immersed the fabric or wool. According to Colorlex, which describes this dye as shellfish purple, the colour is composed of a mixture of indigo dyes, indigo, monobromo indigo, and dibromo indigo, with a small amount of the corresponding indirubins. All these molecules are either purple or blue. This is dibromo indigo's molecular structure. You can see it is identical to indigo, but with two bromine atoms, one on each end. Depending upon the particular species of mollusk, dibromo indigo can vary from 77% to 91% of the dye. Lacar's Duthiers hoped to commercialise the process to fund further research. So why are mucographs so rare today? Firstly, the name properly counted against it. Secondly, a lot of shellfish were needed to get enough dye to produce an image. In 1909, Friedlander processed the hypobranchial glands of 12,000 murex brandaris to obtain 1.4 grams of pigment, which was enough for him to work out the molecular formula. Finally, the penetrating fetid odour previously mentioned was, quote, difficult to get rid of, even after many, many washings. Much as you might want your photographic portrait to be recorded in the exclusive purple of the Roman emperors, nobody wants to have their picture smell of garlic oil. Instantly, after more than a century and a half of natural ageing, my example no longer smells, so this cannot be used as a diagnostic aid in identifying mucographs. Before ending, I should say a little about identification and conservation. FTIR, Raman and Fors will readily identify dibromo indigo. Dibromo indigo will gradually fade through a series of reactions forming coloured and colourless compounds along the way. During this series of reactions, the colour gradually shifts from purple to blue before fading out completely. 
Thank you for listening. Thanks, Nicola. We're running a bit um, out of time, but uh, I think we can take a bit over from the break. And uh, Rasa, um, um, maybe uh, you want to share your screen. You, you want to share your screen again for the second talk on preservation and conservation of the photographic archive of the Coptic archive in Cairo. Okay. Sorry. Nick, is the, the break or now? Uh, no, 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 you can go ahead now. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, I'm sorry. There is wrong in my lab. Uh, in my laptop. Could I uh, prepare it uh, after the break? I'm sorry. Um. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Or even like if you want, maybe we can do it. Um. At the at the end of the talk, maybe. Okay. Like, Yes, so we yes. can, um, I think we're going to have more time. Okay. Is that fine? No, no, okay. okay. So uh, maybe we can go on. Uh, after, after the break, it's good. Uh, I'm sorry, my lab is hanging. Okay, sorry. Just after the break. Okay. okay. I think, okay, okay, let's do that. Let's do that. Then maybe we can have like a bit shorter, um, a break as well. Okay. Um, so we go for questions then. Yeah. Um, let's see if anyone has posted any questions on uh, the chat. Uh, there's no questions on the chat. Okay. Um, so first of all, maybe I can go one. Uh, I would like to ask uh, basically um, uh, have you found any like maybe cold storage um, would um, act as a uh, would act as a kind of mitigation measure for the um, for the photographs in terms to prevent the yellowing sorry I, I, I couldn't hear it would broke up a bit then no I asked if uh, if you think that the cold storage could act as a prevention measure for preventing, like the the yellowing of the uh, of the photographs because mm -hmm. of the of the story of the of the material. Yeah, I think um, I think it would definitely help. But I think in this scenario, it was a combination, mm -hmm. um, a combination of the fact that the frame was not. Um, apologies for now. Sorry. Um, that's okay. Yeah. So I think it was a combination of the fact that the frame was not sealed at the back, and also this um, this adhesive tape that was underneath. Um, so I think in that scenario, because it wouldn't have been necessarily like it was a controlled environment, but it wasn't cold storage whilst it was on display, um, which is also probably why we've had it in the collection for you know twenty years, and it's only just happened now. It's because of this specific kind of display scenario. Um, and, you know, if the frame was properly sealed at the back, maybe it wouldn't have occurred at all. Maybe it was, you know, a combination of all these factors that had to be kind of aligned in order for this yelling to happen. But now that it's happened, and because it's had a life within the museum, it's very difficult for us to say for certain what happened. But, yeah, that's kind of the conclusion that's come to Thanks. Uh, Marta has a question. Yes. Okay, do you hear me now? You're on mute, yeah. So first of all, thank you to the two speakers. It was a wonderful way of starting my evening from Hong Kong. Um, my question is more general and it's for the three of you, also considering that this event is for us to kind of like learn together. Uh, and one point that I find in common is that the three projects that you spoke about are really heavy based on research, right? All of you had a mystery question and then you have to follow up into solution. 
So for people that might not be that experienced within research of photographic conservation, could each of you say a little bit of where do you find um, either a source of literature or how you approach the research by getting into contact? Because it's from contemporary art to the most historical prints that we can find to all the scientific experimentation. Um, so maybe each of you could tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, it, it's, it's, um, it's difficult, really. Um, you know, looking at historic literature is quite quite handy. Um, sometimes I need to do a little bit, bit of um, uh, analysis. I have to um, talk to my contacts and borrow time on other people's machines, which I think is quite quite common. Uh, we did invest in a second hand um, handheld XRF, um, which then went wrong, and then we got another one replacement which then went wrong and then we were able to make one working one out of the two uh, <laughs> but you know and so i've gone off a bit of a tangent there i wouldn't recommend buying a second hand xrf um, <laughs> but um i mean in in my case it was really just um, a fluke you know i was i was recovering from covid and i was looking at photographs online as sort of comfort viewing feeling awful blah, and um, saw these purple photographs and that was very exciting so then I, I went down this ra lovely rabbit warren um, online and um, uh, got enough information to uh, make me want to really um, explore it and then just just followed it up but Thank yeah it's just just starting one of those random things really how is for Russia? How how did you start promoting this research within Egypt? Because that's a totally different context than the one that we often have in Europe, right? So that's to me that's a really interesting way um, of learning how conservation is being looked at there. Yes, yes. Uh, first, I start uh, studying the photographs, uh, photographic materials. Uh, it's my passion. Uh, to study the degradation of the photographic material uh, because the, there is a uh, mix of materials, uh, gelatin uh, and papers, uh, and also the organic and inorganic materials uh, that makes you uh, want to know the difference, the, the difference between the effect of uh, factors, environmental factors, which environmental factors most affect of the, the, the three together. So um, when I was in the uh, Egyptian museum, I saw that uh, the UV uh, affect more, more than uh, any other uh, factors in the image, especially in the image. That makes it, uh, uh, the, the UV makes uh, the image fading, yellowing and uh, go over uh, according to the time. Uh, because of that, I uh, start to do my research uh, in this area uh, using the different type of UV radiations uh, to know uh, the, the image, the, 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 the energy or the power uh, occur on the image to make it fading and the time uh, uh, of exposing uh, mix the image going. Start to use the SEM first to, to recognize the face, the, face, the morphology of the face, and also the HR and uh, XRF to uh, study the, um, the chemical process. Okay, that's it. Thank you. And um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat um, as well. Uh, the first one was from uh yeah. megan smith for jordan um will take communicate with em in studio about adhesives etc um yeah we'll, we'll definitely kind of communicate what we think the issue was um in this case we don't think it was necessarily uh, mounted and framed by the studio although they might have well they probably were involved in instructing um a frame a separate framing studio on how to mount and frame um, and I've seen a sister print at the National Portrait Gallery which is not framed or mounted in the same way so it's not necessarily that that was kind of the way that Tracy Amin and her studio always mounted the print um, yeah but we'll definitely communicate it and we're trying to kind of 
communicated to like other conservators as well that this might be an issue. Um, there was another one for you, there's a few for you, Jordan. <laughs> um, uh, Sarah Allen says, great paper. You mentioned the other prints of yellowed where adhesive from tape is being present. Is it always the same adhesive, i.e. pressure sensitive? Um, so there was a few different ones, which is worrying. <laughs> so there was um, one scenario where masking tape was placed over um, over a paper photo corner and uh, the yellowing man had managed to occur even though there were several interleaving layers between the masking tape um, and the front of the inkjet print. The other one um, was a neoprene adhesive on the back of an inkjet print and that had caused discoloration at the front. And then, yeah, another type of tape as well, or it was a brown packing tape, which again was not on the inkjet print, but just within the packing materials had managed to cause this discoloration. So it seems to be that quite a few different things can cause it. Um, and then I guess it's difficult because not many of these like tape manufacturers actually um, they don't release a lot of information about the exact components of the different tapes. So it's yeah, very difficult to kind of pinpoint exactly what components are causing it. Yeah. Um, I think we're almost time for the second session. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so for uh, Rash's second presentation, are we doing that? Do we want to do that now or do we want to do it at the end? Um, maybe I think it's it's the, you know, we can either fit it like now and have a bit more time on the break um, yeah. or at the end. Um, it, would Rasha uh, be ready now or would you prefer after the, the break you say it? Yes, after after the break, please. I'm sorry about the, the technology. No worries, <laughs> that's fine. Sorry. sorry. Okay. My, my uh, connection after is the... rather unstable, I would say, so <laughs> it's totally understandable. Uh, guys, sorry. Uh, I just have uh, one question for Jordan. I've already left it in the chat. Uh, if there's you... time. I sorry, Mohammed, we, we're kind of short on time. Would you be able to wait until the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, okay, it's okay. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, right. I'll add it to the questions at the end oh, of this. Okay. It's okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Um. So for our second session, um, the focus is uh, dealing with plastic negatives, and our first speaker is. Alexandros Koukos, who's a conservator at the National Trust. Um, and his presentation is how to produce accurate result results when using the diphenylamine test for the identification of cellulose nitrate film base. So Alexandros, if you'd like to share your screen. Yes, Please. totally. Um, share my screen, there we are. All right. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. May I start? Yeah, all good. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. All right. All so, good, yeah. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, in my five minute presentation, I'm going to be talking about the use of the diphenyl amine test for the identification of the cellulose nitrate film base. And by using the process of elimination, the cellulose acetate and polyester base as well. These types of plastics have been used for the production of the photographic film since the late 19th century and all the way through the 20th century until this day. The diphenylamine solution is made from a solid white crystalline organic compound, the diphenylamine, which from now on I will be calling DPA, and concentrated sulfuric acid. The solution is colorless, but in the presence of nitrate ions, generates a vivid blue color. On this slide, there are three photos of plastic film samples that have been that have been tested with uh, the DPA solution. The formation of the characteristic blue color in all of them 
is indicative of the presence of nitrate ions which have reacted with the solution. However, are they all nitrates? The answer is no. And the reason is that all three types of plastic fill base contain nitrocellulose adhesive layers necessary for the construction of the film called subbing layers. The subbing layers can be found on one or both sides of the plastic base, and their role is to bond the pellicle and the gelatin anticur layer on the plastic. Therefore, the left sample, um, the left sample is polyester, uh, the middle sample is cellulose acetate, and the right is cellulose nitrate. So um, let's look closely at the polyester sample. So by scraping off the subbing layer that produces the blue color on the polyester sample, uh, rinse with water and reapply the DPA solution, there will be no more color formation and therefore the sample is definitely not a nitrate. Uh, it cannot be an acetate either, but, it, but I will explain that on the next slide. What is important here is that the polyester sample will not be destroyed by the strong acidic solution at the end of the process. On this slide at the top photo can be seen the color formation after the application of the DEA solution. At the bottom right photo, the sample has been scraped off from the gelatin and subic layers and DEA has been applied, see yellow circle but there is no more color formation. The photo on the left shows that the sample has completely dissolved by the strong acidic solution. The fact that cellulose acetate will be eventually dissolved by the solution is what helps distinguish cellulose, cellulose acetate from polyester base, which on the contrary can withstand the strong acidic DPA solution. On this slide, the photo on the, on the top left shows that the first DPA application um, the first DPA application, the formation of the blue color. At the top left photo, the gelatin layers are being removed with the scalpel and the sample is rinsed with water, bottom right. In the middle photo on the bottom, a second application of DPA solution inside the green circle has produced a vivid blue color, which confirms that the type of the base is cellulose nitrate. Finally, the bottom left photo shows that the sample has withstand the strong acidic solution. On this slide, I'm using a sampling method recommended by the Canadian Conservation Institute, which is the least destructive and very fast. By gently rubbing the edge of your negative against the frosted surface of the microscopy slide, photo on the left, and applying a drop of TPA solution on the sample, photo on the right, an accurate result can be generated in seconds. The basic principle when using a DPA solution is that the smaller the sample you're using, the more accurate the result will be. And the reason is that a small sample will contain only traces of nitrous cellulose adhesive. And therefore, in the cases of the cellulose acetate and polyester base, there will be no color formation whatsoever. The blue color will only be produced in the film base uh, if the film base is made of cellulose nitrate. In conclusion, the TPA method for the identification of the plastic base is accurate and fast. If the conservator uses larger samples, we'll be able to identify all three plastic bases by using the DPA method only. If the conservator uses microsampling, a polarizing filter will be required to distinguish between polyester and acetate base. The DPA solution has a very long shelf life and it is very easy to use if decanted in small squeezable plastic bottles suitable for strong acids. Finally, the use of PPE is strongly recommended when using DPA because of the corrosiveness of the solution. Uh, that, that, this brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alexandra. That was, that was great. Um, so our, our next uh, presentation is from Mathilde Renault, um, and it's Acetate Problems, Keep Calm and Collaborate. Um, so if you'd like to share your screen, Mathilde. Yep.
Okay, is this on? Yeah, we can see that. Great, okay. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, earlier this year, we noticed blue staining on some of our negatives in storage. Um, this is a known sign of semi-advanced degradation of cellulose acetate films, as we know, where the anti-elation dyes in the film reactivate due to changes in pH, which means our film is becoming acidic. From our database images, which you can see on the lower left, um, which does not appear to show any blue staining, we think that the deterioration has happened in the last 10 years as our database image is from 2011. Um, this unforeseen deterioration has kickstarted a project for us to understand the extent of the issue in our collection, which will then enable us to plan for long-term preservation, uh, including cold storage and possible digitization if necessary. Um, so this talk gives us gives you an overview of our response and the actions that we're currently planning and is also a call for ideas for, from the community as to what we can implement. In the first instance, what we did was to place acid detector strips um, as a in the containers that we identified, which would be containing um, cellulose base negatives. And this was used as a kind of quick test and quick survey to map out our collection and try and understand where, you know, where we had kind of nests of acetic acid or um, where the collection was still uh, safe. Um, so the strips were placed in the containers that we identified and they were retrieved after 48 hours and again after one week. The results were actually a little bit scary um, as we found that 26% showed color shift indicating that deterioration has started and a further 11% indicates uh, advanced decay. So this is based on the, the supplier's charts, the AD strips supplier's charts. Um, due to cataloging gaps and inconsistencies, our trial survey does not actually represent the collection as a whole. So the reliability of our numbers isn't known, but we think that you know it's a good start. But this is why the next step of our project uh, will be the most useful. The museum is currently undertaking a collection-wide audit, um, independent of our conservation input. But this brings us the amazing opportunity to plug into the existing audit methodology to record not only the film types, but also their degradation stages. Uh, when we approached the collections officer, who's in charge of the audit with this idea, um, she was very happy to accommodate the extra effort into their existing workflow. So to support this, uh, we delivered training to the audit team to give them an overview of the history and materials of negatives, uh, plastic based, but also uh, including glass, um, as well as proper handling and health and safety. But most importantly, the training introduces the visual identification methods for film based negatives and the deterioration rating system that we wish them to use during the survey. Um, so this uh, is this grid system that goes from one to six, which is based on the deterioration stages published by the Canadian Institute of Conservation. And we put, we created this uh, visual guide that they, the audit team can keep with them to kind of guide them as they work through the collection. Um, a selection of nitrate, acetate and polyester negatives, uh, as well as glass plates in varying conditions was brought out to demonstrate handling and to familiarize staff with the materials and the different visual clues. And this proved actually really useful because most of the staff had never worked with negatives and they were unaware of the extent that degradation could actually change physically the material. So the, the work done so far is, is still very basic, but it has given us a good opportunity for a review of our current stage uh, and housing and storage, as well as to locate some interesting negatives, uh, including some nitrates that uh, I don't think many people were aware that we had. Um, and it gave us the opportunity to engage and collaborate with departments in contact with the collection. The survey is not quite ready to launch. We just have a few methodology points to iron out, including uh, the conundrum of what do we do with uh, degraded historic, um, historically relevant sleeves. Um, ultimately, we don't expect the audit staff to become experts at film identification, but we are hoping to at least get some more numbers on the negative types in the collection and more importantly, data on the condition, which will help us plan forward and propose, for example, adequate storage facilities such as cold storage, which we currently lack, 
So if anyone has any wisdom to share from previous large scale identification and uh, condition surveys of negatives or regarding cold storage infrastructure, then please do reach out. And I'm of course, really looking forward to the next talk on this topic by Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you, that was, that was great. Um, yeah, so our, our next speaker is Vanessa Torres. Um, who will be speaking about cold storage decision making testing and implementation and Vanessa is conservator at the National Science and Media Museum. Um, I'm going to share Vanessa's presentation which is pre-recorded but she's available for questions after the session. Um, so can everybody see Vanessa's presentation? Yeah. Yes. The Media Museum. Okay. Sorry, sorry, Vanessa. Hi. Today I'll talk about the implementation of cold storage at the National Science and Media Museum, which was made possible by the transfer of the Oxford Publishing Company Rail Print Collection from one of our sister museums to us here in Bradford. The OPC is largely composed of photographic and uh, archival materials. During this talk, I will focus on its film-based uh, materials only. Prior to transferring the collection to Bradford, the project team carried out a survey to identify different film materials based on their visual characteristics. There was no deterioration of cellulose acetate due to a noticeable vinegar smell in the room, and upon visual inspection, it had been established that despite some decay, the majority of acetate was in fairly good condition. However, I recommend that prior to repacking the collection for transfer, AD strips should be used to measure the severity of acidity levels in the boxes containing film-based materials. And based on the results, a decision should be made on whether to implement cold storage as a risk management uh, to existing collections already stored uh, in Bradford. The AD strips show that about 38% of acetate items measured acidity levels of 1.5 or above, meaning a rapid increase in the rate of decay has started, in which cold or frozen storage are recommended as an action. It was therefore decided that the 38 boxes out of a total count of 98 repacked boxes containing acetate film would be stored in cold storage. And due to the range of sizes of boxes we've inherited, we use the National Park Service, Service uh, cold storage packing method and purchased three lab spec uh, spark free freezers. This packing method involved the use of a static shielding bag, a thick poly bag, tapes, filler material, and um, humidity cards. It was, uh, it, this method required some practice and it took longer to complete that initially uh, estimated. But prior to implementation, I reached out to colleagues that already had cold storage to understand what the expected fluctuations in temperature and relative humidity were, and when, uh, particularly when collections uh, were removed from the freezer. Unfortunately, I didn't have access to data, therefore I decided to carry out some tests myself to measure the overall performance of the freezers and the packing method, and also to simulate scenarios uh, and have a plan of action uh, for when and if the freezers break down and salvage might be needed, and uh, for access to collections in cold storage um, was required. So firstly, I added a temperature and relative humidity monitor inside the freezer compartment and packed a monitor inside the seal box following the NPSS packing method. The packed box showed 45% less relative humidity value than the monitor inside the freezer compartment at an average of 31%. This graphic uh, here also shows a simulation of a freezer breaking down where the boxes were kept inside the freezer. Changes occurred rapidly in the first four hours, stabilizing fully after 24 hours at 17 percent 17 degrees celsius and 45 percent relative humidity in the box and at 100 percent inside the freezer compartment 
In the scenario here, I test the removal of a sealed box from the freezer to a tabletop at room temperature. This aim to test acclimatization without use of a frame. The RH inside the box raised from 30 to 74 percent in five minutes, and it took about two hours to reach room uh, values at 45 percent. The temperature inside the box displayed a gradual rise from minus uh, 18 degrees Celsius to 17 uh, C in about uh, three hours. Then I tested the removal of the seal box from the freezer to room temperature, but this time I placed the seal box in a cool, in a cool uh, box uh, with um, buffering material. The temperature uh, reached uh, room conditions in the double of the time as previously uh, from three hours to six and the RH reached a lower peak than previously at uh, 52%. The RH took the double of uh, the time as previously to stabilize at 45%, so in about four hours. As expected, the use of buffering is effective in slowing down the fluctuations of temperature and relative humidity inside the seal box upon removal from the freezer. And this helps us define the time frame of acclimatization for access to the collections stored in, in frozen store, storage to 12 hours uh, with a very minimum, uh, very minimum of six hours. In this slide here, you can see some boxes neatly packed inside the freezer and they're very stable conditions. By implementing cold storage, we increase the lifespan of the OPC collection from 10 years to 5,540 years. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, so that's our three speakers for this session. So we've now got some time for questions. Um, I think we had a few on the chat. Oh, Yana, you're muted. We have one question from Nicolas to Alexandros. Um, how, how do you dispose of the waste solution? Oh, sorry. Um, hello? Yes. Hello, Nicholas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, I, 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 you know, I haven't really got to the, you know, to the position to, 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 to need disposing the solution because, um, as I said, the self life is very, very long. You can keep this, this, uh, the, the solution for, for years. Uh, it's going to turn a little bit darker, you know, light brown, but it will still work fine. Um, so, um, yeah. But I think the, there must be in place, you know, procedure for disposing acids. Um, yeah, the, the, I think you can dispose small quantities of acids, you know, um, uh, through the drain. I mean, you know, but but the problem is the diphenylamine that is uh, very toxic to um, um, uh, aquatic, uh, you know, environments. So that's, uh, I think, the main problem. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, just to add that I think usually there are um, specific companies that can deal with um, wasting uh, hazardous chemicals. So um, when I was working at the National Library of Scotland, we had like a company that would come and collect um, uh, any chemicals that we wanted to dispose and of course we wanted, didn't want to um, uh, put down the drain. So um, Maybe I can. I can yeah, find that, that it, there wasn't really there wasn't really what I was asking. The the used solution when you when you're doing your tests, you know, yes. obviously you're doing test after test after test. Um, well, what happens to that that little bit of used solution? Oh, you mean the drop that you're using to yeah, test yeah, your yeah, sample? Yeah. So yeah. that can be absorbed, uh, you know, um, uh, to uh, on a tissue, you know, and then just put it in the bin because it's just that tiny amount is just a drop that you only need for your test. 
so yes, that that what I'm doing, you know, just soaking up uh, on the tissue and then put it in the bean. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, there is also uh, another question by Sarah by Saya um, to Alexandros. Uh, she was asking if you carried out a risk assessment before testing. Yes, hello, Saya. I hope you're all right. Yes, uh, I, I, I've always do. You know, this is the, the main process. You have to carry out a risk assessment for every sort of uh, treatment or testing um, you, you're going to be carried out. And uh, there is another question by Sophie Andulov to Vanessa. Uh, hi, Vanessa. How long did it take to package your uh, so those acetate materials for cold storage. Did you have to dispose of many old housing materials? Hi, so I I inherited the boxes already packed from our colleagues um, working in London on that collection. So I didn't have to dispose of any packing materials that work has been carried out before the boxes arrived to me. And as far as how long it took, I don't really have um, a, a specific number because I carried out that task alongside other tasks. So I've uh, worked on it in several sessions um, and then it was taking a bit longer than uh, it expected. So I just call on numbers from other colleagues in the Science Museum group to which my museum is part of. So I was able to just in another day, finish up uh, all the boxes. But you know, considering that there were only 38 boxes, I would say maybe if I had done it consistently, just that task, perhaps I could have completed it in one week with other two people, presumably. I think so, perhaps so. Yeah, I'm confident about that. But because I didn't do it consistently, it was just as I had time, it took a bit longer. Great. Thanks, Vanessa. One, one last question, actually, I would like to ask. Do you have any plan for... Um, uh, accessing these materials in case someone um, asks for them. Um... So the way that this the project was devised, there was no um, digitization. So none of those objects were digitized. That would have been my preferred option. So we could have given access to digital assets. Uh, but because that wasn't possible, um, we don't have, of course, we don't know if it's going to be requested for access, but if it's going to be requested for access, we, are, we can facilitate that. And because I've carried out the tests for understanding how long it would take for fully acclimatize, um, and now I know that it's okay to remove the box, a box from the freezer, uh, and within the minimum of six hours, we can give access to researchers or to colleagues that want to see it. Um, and we have a, a full map of where the items are in the freezer. So we have a really minimum amount of time um, of aperture of the door. So we don't want to kind of um, mess up with the environmental conditions inside the freezer. So we know exactly where the boxes are and where the items are inside the box. So we'll remove the box as quickly as possible and shut the freezer again. Uh, maybe we should go on a break. We'll have a last question from Dominique, um, maybe like, if you can answer very quickly, and then we go for a break. Uh, Dominic is asking, um, uh, did you repack the negative envelopes or leave them as they were before packing the boxes into the bags? Yes, yeah, so they, part of the project, there was no scope and money, if I'm frank, to rehouse every single uh, negative. So the glassine envelopes, and they're primarily inside glassine, original glassine envelopes, they were kept. Only the boxes were new and to a conservation standard. But it's also known that because we are implementing cold storage, the negative aspects that the glassine uh, envelopes could bring to the object is also minimized by the lower conditions of temperature and relative humidity. Great. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, I think we can um, we can have a break uh, for now. And um, can you hear me? Yeah. And um, we can come back at uh, quarter past eleven, maybe about like eight minutes, seven seven minutes. Um, maybe before we start, I know we're gonna run a bit uh, behind schedule, but. Um, Rasa, if you're um, listening to us, would you like to um, go ahead now?
for your talk. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready, but I hope that my lab is ready. Okay, I will share the presentation. You, mm -hmm. So you're going to be talking about preservation and conservation of photographic archive of Coptic archive in Cairo. Apologies to uh, Nicolas. Sorry, Nicolas. Is that okay if we just let like, put three this uh, talk through before yours? Yeah, no problem at all. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Rasa. Can, just a second, please. Uh, I try to share my screen. I don't share, okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay. You see my presentation? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's good. Okay. Okay. I start? Yes. What? Okay, uh, this project is uh, applied part of the the first one. Okay, uh, after I study the photo uh, photo uh, photochemical uh, degradation in the photographs, I doing that applied in the Coptic uh, uh, museum in the archival uh, photographs. Okay. Uh, in the same group. Uh, the Coptic Museum is uh, distinguished from the other Egyptian museums by its impressive uh, photo, uh, top, topographical and historical location. Uh, this album is uh, number two in general record of the Coptic Museum. Uh, upon study, uh, studying and examination, uh, this album, it was found, it's, uh, it, it, it is dated back to the time of the opening of the new wing of the Coptic Museum. The importance of these photos is due to being a historical record documenting the opening of the new wing and uh, uh, showing the methods of celebration and customs uh, VIB visiting of the museum, excavation in St. Catherine, displaying of uh, uh, the pieces in that time, uh, outside or inside the museum. Uh, we found here the, the damage of the album. Uh, there is uh, uh, different uh, types of the damage. Uh, uh, the dryness uh, uh, as a result of the poor storage uh, process in a very dry uh, atmosphere and exposed to the uh, photo and chemical factors. Uh, this led uh, to the exposure of the pages of, uh, of the album to extreme dryness and uh, the brightness, uh, fra fragility, and the ease, the ease of losing part of them. Uh, the photographs have uh, silver mirroring. Uh, this is the album. Uh, there is many uh, deterioration in tears and loses. Uh, the photographs, there is a silver mirroring in the photographs and ink stains, uh, also the adhesive stains and, and fingerprints. Um, here, uh, using the USB digital microscope to uh, identify the the types of the stains here in the photographs and uh, the, the album pages. I use here a uh, UV, uh, UV photogra photo photogrammetry to identify if there is a, 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 micro, a microorganism or not, micro, microbiological damage or not. Here found after we're using the, swab, the biological swab, I found uh, some uh, uh, bacteria and fungi, uh, but actually it's common. Uh, it's a stable uh, if, the, if there is a control uh, in, the, uh, in the storage area, control of uh, temperature and humidity. Uh, after that, I'm doing a conservation process First, mechanical cleaning of stains and dust. After that, the chemical cleaning using uh, uh, alcohol. Uh, after that, uh, tears. Uh, here, I treated uh, to uh, using a, a, a tissue paper and consider, uh, co consolidation of uh, the weak area. Completing miss uh, missing part here in the edges. 
uh, of the album pages and uh, the code identification code in the cover. Uh, after that, the final uh, part is uh, rebinding the album uh, using the same the same uh, materials, uh, uh, special, uh, but uh, expect the using the uh, tissue paper uh, to uh, to be uh, inside the, the album uh, for humidity. Uh, this is the final part. I I I, I using the plexiglass to display the album and uh, uh, a box to put it in the storage area. Okay. Thanks. I tried to be in the time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's Thank great. You. Thank you very much. Uh, sharing stop that. sharing. Okay. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> and then. Um, uh, now we can go to um, the next one, which is by Nicholas Parnett. He's going to be talking to us about initial work on a group of early color photographs by Hugh Urbiliak, Roger Smith. Okay. Thank you. Now, um, okay. So, early, in the early 1990s, while searching for photographs to add to my reference collection of photographic processes and materials, I bought a group of about 700 magic lantern slides, mostly of British and European landscapes. I was very happy to find them. The dealer who had them had just retired and told me he nearly threw them away years ago, but then thought there will always be someone who will want them, and he was right. There was no information with the slides other than the locations written on the binding strips. Fortunately, in 2020, I managed to pin down the photographer as Dr. Hugh Rubiak Roger Smith, 1867 to 1955. Doctor, photographer, plant hunter and mountaineer. Approximately 600 of the slides were in colour, of which about half were by the Sanger Shepherd process. These are probably the earliest colour slides present. When the autochrome process was launched in 1907, Dr. Roger Smith quickly switched as the processing time requires only a fraction of that needed by the Sanger Shepherd process. Writing in December 1902, Sarah Angelina Ackland, a famous user of the process, wrote that she completed 26 slides since the end of October, which equates to something like four a week. In addition to the Sanger Shepherd and Autochrome processes, the group also contains Dufe Dioct Comb, uh, Thames and Paget colour processes. The Sanger Shepherd process is a subtractive colour process. To produce the final image, three negatives are taken, one through a green filter, one through red, and the final one through a blue filter. These are then used to produce positive transparencies using the complementary colours magenta, yellow, and cyan. In the Sanger Shepherd process, the cyan image is produced by ferrocyanide toning of a developed out silver image on glass. The magenta and yellow transparencies, on the other hand, are produced on bichromate sensitized gelatin with a little silver bromide on a clear celluloid base. The exposure is through the base, followed by washing in hot water to remove the unhardened gelatin, fixing to remove the silver bromide, washing and then drying the resulting matrices. The three images are assembled on top of one another, a cover glass added, and the groups secured together with black binding tape though it was recommended the images be cemented with Canada balsam. There's a special place in heaven for people who label their photographs and Roger Smith added the location in white ink on the binding tape. The locations photographed have probably never been photographed in colour before, so they really are rather important. Unfortunately, the celluloid support is composed of cellulose nitrate with camphor as a plasticizer. The camphor slowly evaporates, permeates out through the binding tape and is lost. This results in the cellulose nitrate shrinking and the magenta and yellow transparencies going out of register. We can digitally restore the images. The first stage is to digitize the individual elements. Then the magenta and yellow images are stretched to bring them back into alignment with the cyan image, which, as you remember, is on glass and so hasn't shrunk. For the trial, I picked a slide where the binding tape has been cut in the past. The trial image is labeled as Dawlish Warren, which is in Devon in England. So here it is. Now, my first attempt used images taken with a light box, DSLR camera and a macro lens. Not having time to play around in Photoshop, I paid for the three digital images to be aligned professionally. 
The result is attractive enough, but the colours have been altered to the retoucher's idea of what they should be. I explain that the colours won't look right and ask them not to be adjusted. But the retoucher's second attempt was reasonably good and looked closer to the original slide, but I could see there was a lot of highlight detail missing. Next, I used an Arctic Scan 1800F scanner. This caught the highlights, but also every imperfection in each image. I probably need to move to a wet scanning technique to suppress these defects. It's immediately clear, though, that Roger Smith used repeating back to take three exposures in succession. The waves have moved and created wonderful colour effects. In the background, a steam train, just here, has chugged along between exposures, resulting in madly coloured steam plumes. The overall effect is rather painterly, though the paper mask covered the most colourful parts of the foreground. Projecting these slides isn't an option, but viewing the slides enlarged on a computer screen, the bigger the better, is closer to the original experience than holding the originals to the light or looking at reproductions printed on a page. Sanger Shepard's slides deteriorate in a number of additional ways. The glass surface beneath the cyan layer decays and produces dendritic growths, which you can see in the top two on the left. Um, the cellulose nitrate also degrades, and as the pH of the gelatin drops, it will eventually liquidize. The binding tapes fall off or tear. To slow the decay, I use cold storage. This is a variation of Mark McCormick Goodhart's critical moisture indicator system. I hope it's been interesting. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Nicola. That, that was super interesting and really lovely images. Um, we can go to the next one, uh, who is uh, Paula Ogaya Oroz is a conservation student at the Advanced Professional Program uh, of the University of Amsterdam, Photography Speciality, and she is going to be talking to us about vindicating for a negative documentation. Thanks, Paula. Rapala, we we can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't we can't hear you. Hello. Paula. Uh, can you all see my uh, presentation? I think now we. And can you can, all you're hear? You're breaking up a bit. Probably. I I hope so. Um, well. I am Paula, and this presentation comes from. Oh no! Mm, maybe Paula has some problems with her connection. Um, Paula, can you hear us? Are you there? Okay, maybe maybe we can go to the next one and then Paula can uh, present afterwards. Um, maybe that would be easier. Um, sorry, sorry, Paula. Um, so the next one is uh, Maria Marilena Jana Kerry. She's a books and books and archives conservator at the Library and Information Center of the University of Thessaly. And uh, she's going to be talking to us about digitization and what about the physical object. Hello, uh, Maria? You. I'll just share my screen. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. Everything yes, visible? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can hear you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, today, I would like to talk about what happens to the actual objects of collections during and after digitization projects. The European community has established a program called Information Society, which concerns the implementation of the Digital Transformation Bible in Greece. In that framework, an increasing number of projects have taken place in the last decade or so, involving variable archives and collections. Frequently, such projects are initiated without adequate methodology planning regarding handling, conservation, and preservation. Many times, the staff is not trained or specialized. Quantity of digitized material tends to prevail over quality of process. Workflow is not to be disturbed. 
So what about the physical object society? There is a large diversity of materials in archives, which very often include photographic items, but the specific requirements necessary for their preservation seem to be diminished or ignored. The reason behind this is usually simple lack of knowledge and expertise, but also unwillingness to conform to troublesome instructions. Is digitization the sole purpose? As a result, during processing, several improvisations, so to speak, are observed in order for the digitization task to be accomplished without fuss within a set time frame. Usually, there is lack of expert advice, but also lack of time or will to seek it. Hasty actions may also occur due to lack of appropriate materials, which would facilitate the workflow while simultaneously implement the necessary preservation measure measures. Such materials would have to be pointed out by conservator and wardens. Hello? I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting you. We don't no. see any. I don't know if you meant to change the slide. No, I didn't. I, I just want you ah. to observe the improvisation. So oh, no. so <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Such materials would have to be pointed out by conservator in accordance to each collection's specific requirements. And there's a change. On the other hand, good practices can be applied in advance to ensure preservation at best terms possible in each case. Uh, we, we don't see the change, sorry. I think oh, maybe sorry. if you if you go yeah. on um, uh, the slideshow okay. present the slideshow mode, because we can currently see the rest of the slides as well. Ah. I am in, I see the slide so more the, I see the slide show. Well, not, now we, we see the next slide, okay. but yeah. Right. Again, now? Perfect, yeah, okay. thanks, <laughs> sorry. No, no, it's okay. Uh, on the other hand, good practices can be applied in advance to ensure preservation at best terms possible in each case. Here is an example of a project that was carried out with the cooperation of external contractors for the specialized conservation, digitization, and housing of a negatives collection. The specifications, such as expert conservation, handling, and storage materials were included in the project proposal and were a prerequisite in order for the collection to be processed. This led to a result of proper housing, monitoring capacity, and accessibility of the collection. Moreover, the digital archives deliver, derived were detailed and of high quality. On another note, when such help cannot be acquired, simpler actions can be taken in order to mitigate the deterioration of the original objects. Such is the example in the slide on the right, where loose frames of film in a photographic box were arranged into groups and placed in smaller folders to avoid abrasion, improve storage conditions, and facilitate access. Um, did the slide change? Okay, good. While the benefits of digitization are certainly acknowledged, both in terms of information preservation and dissemination, as well as the original's protection from wear and tear, there are arguments to be raised in relation to digital collection sustainability and therefore accessibility, plus contemplation about digital copies, artifactual precision the importance of the physical collections and therefore the significance of their preservation should not be lessened. Let's not forget not, that not everything can be digitized. Research is undermined if restricted exclusively to digital repositories. I believe there are two key factors in order to establish basic preservation standards implementation. First, which I believe is imperative, to involve a preservation specialist in all stages of digitization projects, such as planning, executing, and meetings during the process, in order to communicate necessities that are presented. And second, to increase awareness about preventive conservation and preservation amongst both staff and organizers, resulting to a positive attitude towards training and actual practical application of conservation principles. So closing on a positive note, when the, where there's a will, there's a way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria. That's uh, really interesting. Um, you can stop sharing your screen now, if you want. Good. And um, I don't know if uh, Paula uh, managed to uh, sign back in. Uh, yes. Can, can you hear me properly now? Yes, yes. Great. Would you like to go to yes. now? Yes. Great. Is this working properly? Can you? I think you can yes. see it, right? Thank you. Apologies for the uh, technical problems. No but um, well, this is my presentation, vindicating for negative documentation, um, and is part of 
well, it's not really a part, but it's a small piece of the research that I did for uh, the master in the University of Amsterdam that was around uh, the girl types and hand coloring. And here, um, this is the work that we're gonna take. Um, I'm gonna talk just a tiny bit about the girl types and then a why and how and a, some previous solutions and a small kit and the conclusions because we only have um, five minutes. So the daguerreotype, I hope you have um, all had the chance to have a daguerreotype in your hands. Uh, they're amazing objects. And the special thing about them is that they're negative and positive at the same time. And if you have ever had the chance to try to document them, they're very difficult because they have um, this very reflective uh, uh, surface. So here in the middle, you can see uh, a failed attempt to document them because you can actually see the lens just right in the middle um so not great but it is important to document them um just for the conservation practice but then what about the negative um side of of the daguerreotype those are important as well um we tend to do the positive because that's the one that we we see that's how we see the world and it's the way that it was intended but why do we do the negative well it tells us a lot of information about the surface of the daguerreotype. Um, it has is a good recording of the dual nature of it. Um, at the end of the day, when you have them in your hand, you see both the negative and the positive, and actually can help us record um, uh, elements that to the naked eye are not visible. So here on the right, this is actually a daguerreotype from my personal collection. Uh, from top to bottom, there are the um, positive view, just normal view. And then there, uh, there's the negative. And if you look at the face closely, you can see that there's in the cheeks and the mouth is a little bit more blue. Um, and this is probably because there was some application of color and you can see that more easily with the negative. And just the last image, that's uh, the detail inverse of the negative. So how to do this? Because it's already kind of challenging to take a photograph of the daguerreotype. Uh, there is this very lovely article for Ravianans from 2014. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but basic thing is that you want the, the light coming from one side in a 90 degree angle, uh, a glass in a 45 degree angle. So it reflects on uh, the light reflects on the glass, goes down to the object and then up to the camera. And the Rex Museum has a very lovely uh, set, very sturdy, very big set uh, to put the glass on because in the article, it doesn't tell you how to do it. And it doesn't feel too safe to have just the glass hanging on top of your object. Um, but the problem that I had that I was traveling, I couldn't take this very big stuff from the Rex Museum. I was going to Germany to look at some of the types. So I designed a prototype, uh, a small one that will be um, do and undo. Uh, these are the only images, the ones on the right that I have not taken because this prototype was done by my dad. Um, and he took these ones. But it's just um, the, the basic thing it was that it needed to be small and portable because I was traveling with it. And this is the final one. You can see the measures on the right um, and you can undo it and do it. So you can store it flat. Um, it is quite small, but you can adjust the, the length of it. So the middle piece can be a slide more in or out of one of the sides. So if you have a smaller glass, you can adjust it to it. And now that you have seen this, well, the conclusions, I believe that it's quite important to, uh, to record the negative side. I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, of course, it's a bit challenging, as I said, just to document a daguerreotype is challenging itself, but to do the negative, you need some help. Um, and in this case, if you have the space, you can go for the Rex Museum solution. It's lovely, it's very good, but if you're like me, traveling, and you don't have really a space to, for that big uh, bulk, you can opt for this because it's a small and you can store it. And of course it has some limitations as the size, but well, um, thank you for your attention and thank you for the opportunity to talk. I hope it was useful. Thank you very much, Paula. That's uh, super useful. Actually, maybe uh, your uh, your father he can have like a pattern. And <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's brilliant to be able to carry around this, um, this equipment. Uh, I'm aware that we don't have much time uh, for questions. Maybe we can steal a bit, uh, uh, like maybe five minutes from the next session and um, address any questions that um, 
uh, are currently, are there any questions on the chat? There's one I've just put on there, which is from Adia. Um, uh, thank you, Mary Lena, for your talk, and especially for reminding me the project we undertook at the Conservation Laboratory. It was a great experience for us. As I understood from your presentation, you wanted to show a good practice of digitization example. But what happens when there aren't conservation measures taken before digitization? Have you dealt with a situation like that? Um, hi, Adia. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, yes, uh, I constantly <laughs> deal with such situations. That's why I, you know, I did the step, the, the step of uh, raising awareness. I have to talk to everyone about it. Um, sometimes um, you see these examples uh, that I, I gave uh, that are done during the project, but at the same time, um, for example, money appears, you know, to have to get some um, materials for that. So um, I guess what happens is a double job because in, after the digitization and, and doing something um, hastily, uh, you have to go back and do the rehousing or um, replace again paper clips and things like that. Um, and I, I have found that many times, you know, during, although there are some instructions and there are some suggestions to the staff uh, doing uh, the, the digitization, um, um, during the course of uh, work, uh, they stop doing the good practices or things like that because it's not convenient, because maybe they lack materials, they don't inform someone because, you know, there's a workflow, so the whole project goes uh, to a different uh, path, it, it's it's um it's a difficult uh, thing to to uh, to to handle and and also even if there is a conservator, as I pointed out, which is in our case here, for example, and at the university, there are some projects of uh, digitization that um, you know the the staff don't want to really you know, ask or have someone go in and, and make them um, do things differently. <laughs> That's it, more or less. That's why it's, I mean, I think it's, uh, here's the point where it's more, it's more important to actually put more efforts on um, uh, outreach and basically, yeah. um, of course, like, you know, trying to uh, resource funding in order to have uh, conservators in positions like that. Um, especially like in places like Greece, and um, but also like to try to make people aware of why this is important to happen. Yes. And um, I also wanted to add that um, it's not only about the digitization, just of of the object of the of the of the content of the object, and like uh, in a, of the image in that case, but it's also important the, the information around it. Um, like any information that are coming like on the, uh, for example, like the pockets of the negatives that um, exactly. are held, in, like any surrounding like notes or, uh, you know, all of these are important. And if these are lost, essentially yeah. like just having the digital image doesn't like, it won't, you know, it won't be the same in the end. Um, and that's why the, having the physical object always. Um, Can I add something that... Um... <laughs> I've had a struggle convincing, and I haven't succeeded really, um, for the project to include dimensions, objects. Because, you know, there are many documents, many photographs, many, many thousands of things, and, and they, they omitted the dimension factor. Probably because, um, I don't know, it was too time consuming or something like that. Or they don't, and now the problem is they don't beforehand consult a conservator. So in during the um, the project, so much can be done, and no one can be convinced really <laughs> easily. We should uh, we should advocate more for this. I think. <laughs> um, there is another question uh, by um, uh, Rasa to to you, Maria. Um, yeah. Maria when describing the image <laughs> after the digitization process in the report. Do you start by describing the material of the image or the subject of the image? For me, that's the question. That's not my area. 
So, I mean, it's a different thing describing for conservation purposes and another thing uh, describing, they do put in some characteristic, I thought about it, you know, I said, please, um, it's even difficult to, to include um, uh, exactly what kind of, uh, what type it is. Maybe you'll have photograph further than that. You know, you can't have a specialized uh, uh, information, but um, so I'm not sure. I think uh, it's not, uh, many, many characteristics are uh, described in uh, the digital. Can I answer? Sorry. Can I answer to you? Oh, so that wasn't for me. Yes, please. Sorry, I'm, I don't have a oh. video. Uh, sorry, if I may answer to, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. We can hear ah, you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Breaking up a bit. Sorry, if I may answer. Sorry, uh, we uh, we started first uh, before starting the digitization. We uh, the all the material uh, uh, was recognized. We made uh, the tests for uh, acetate, uh, nitrate. It was also important it, uh, the materials in order to put them in the right uh, conservation storage. Uh, Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, the next record is the of the material. I don't know if you hear me. I think Adia could, could answer that. Uh, maybe I can write it down. Uh, yeah, maybe. Okay. Maybe if that's like more convenient. I will write down the. Answer. Just also aware of time, and uh, I think maybe we should go over to the next uh, session. Yeah, so our next session is our Can final. you hear me now? We can. Adia, Adi, if you put your question or your response in the chat um, for people to see, and we'll just continue with the next session, um, which is on treatments. And our first speaker for this session is uh, Mohammed Hendi, um, who, who's a pho photographs conservator at the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities. Um, and his talk is on housing broken glass plates, new approach. Um, so if you can share your screen, Mohammed. All right, I can share me first. Share you <laughs> and your <laughs> Then we can share on my screen. All right, so I have only, uh, I have only five, minutes so let's start about my treatment right so we are conservators as conservators we face many problems but i believe that the main problems that we face as conservators is that uh, having a meeting point between curators and conservators all right so uh, uh, my so so I I am in a project now to um, uh, in, in a photographic collection that contains films and uh, like many kind of different of photographic materials. Okay, so I faced that problem because I work with two curators, and uh, uh, one of the collections that I'm working on is the glass uh, blades. All right. So uh, in the glass plate, I am working from my conservation point of view. So my target is to uh, my target is to preserve and conserve the the the, um, the object, which is the glass plate. And their target they have to be accessible and be displayed and stuff like that. So I had here to ah one more question, one more problem that I face with them that is that bad handling. Right, so I had two options here. Uh, the first option, which I tried, I didn't succeed. That I had to convince them that uh, you cannot handle like that, you cannot do that, and it was very difficult. And I didn't succeed because you cannot, um, you know, you cannot um, convince someone who has been doing the same thing for like the past twenty years to change it immediately. 
So the second option that I went that's to, um, you know, to have uh, to innovate or to develop new type of housing for uh, new type of housing for glass plates, that type of housing in that type of housing, uh, so you will have uh, the ability to display, you will have the ability to scan, you just have the ability to digitize, to print out, and uh, the most, and the display, and the most important thing that uh, using this kind of housing, you will avoid any future bad handling, like do whatever you want, nothing will happen to your glass plates. So without further talking about that as photograph conservator uh, and, and picture tells that like a thousand story. So I will share with you one video and I hope you will enjoyed that was my meeting point with concert with curators so that was my video okay can you all see yeah we can see all right So using that video, you will find it's two kind of uh, sizes, all right? As you see, this is like the small size. You can display, you can dig dive. Mm -hmm. This is the large one, the large size. Mm -hmm. This is like the final. This is how you place. Yes. This is how you place the negative inside the housing. You have here that house that has missing piece. This one has uh, the image layer down and has to be housed like this. Okay. All right. So uh, I used, I didn't use any tape materials. So the, the pieces I collect, the pieces together are like inside together, still using the same um, BAT, BAT cardboard. All right. So you didn't use, use only tape to adhere the, you know, the plastic uh, base uh, uh, into the, the housing, the body itself. So that was my presentation. I guess I passed my time by I think 19 seconds. So I'm done. That's fine. We'll let you do that. <laughs> um, thanks, Mohammed. That's great. You're it's welcome. nice to see a video. As well. That's really, really good of way, way of um, seeing it. Um, so our next speaker is um, Adia Adamopoulou. Um, I'm going to share her presentation, but again, she'll be available for questions at the end of the session. Um, so, just share my screen. Can everybody see that? Should it be a black screen? All good? Good evening, everyone. I'm Adia Damopoulou, a conservator of works of art and photographs from Athens, Greece, and I'm really glad to be joining this meeting. I'm going to present you the conservation of Icarus, a unique Sibachrom print by Boyd Webb, made in 1982. Boyd Webb was born in New Zealand, where he completed his art studies, and then in London, where he lives and works. His artistic language is minimal, humoristic, ironic, and surrealistic. In this artwork, he uses the Greek myth of Daedalus and Icarus to make a 
sarcastic comment about levitation, staging an elephant trying to elevate a carpet that looks like dried grass that the enormous animal steps on. A brief reminder about the photographic technique. A cibachrome is a positive image obtained directly from a slide, a so-called autopositive process. The final image material are azodized. The binder is gelatin and the support can either be polyester or resin coated paper. The artwork took part in an exhibition at an Athenian gallery last year and presented some peculiar conservation issues caused by the way of mounting, placing the photographing barrier to fall inside the frame. Photographic paper is nailed on a sheet of white plywood. The plywood is placed in a wooden frame with glass and wooden spacer respectively. Although the gallery curators were worried about the top right corner, it became immediately obvious that the low right corner was also problematic. This is after the removal from the frame. Notice that the photographic paper is not flat, presenting tensions and curling. The nails penetrate the four corners of the photographic paper through metallic hoops, which have been integrated into the paper. The hoops have rusted and the damaging effect is transmitted onto the photographic paper. Tears have been formed in the upper and lower right perforated corners, which indicates that the frame was stored leaning on the left side for a long time. In the verso, a piece of gaffer tape had been placed in all corners, probably to protect the paper from tearing when the metallic hoops were being attached to the paper. This tape has been partially detached and the adhesive has been oxidized. The first treatment step was to carefully remove the nails from the plywood. Both nails and plywood holes were chemically cleaned and coated with a protective layer. All hoops were treated like that as well. Fortunately, they could be opened thanks to their petal shape on the back side. The gaffer tape was lifted mechanically and the adhesive residues were cleaned from the verse of the photograph. Tolwen gave the most satisfactory result and was proved safe for the Sibachrom support. The most severe damage is the one located on the upper right corner of the photograph. The substrate is torn and creased and if it is left untreated, the photograph will eventually slip inside the frame, causing further damages. So the tear was consolidated with Lascaux and Picoso paper from the verso and the new linen tape was placed on top for extra strength and durability. Retouching was done using Barita in Aquazor, Guas colors and pencils. On the low right corner, less severe damages were noticed. A piece of detached paper under the hoop, small tears, wrinkles and rust from the hoops. Again, the same treatment steps were followed and the same conservation materials were used as mentioned before. The other two corners of the left rectocyte suffer only from adhesive residues and slight detachment of gaffer tape. Those two corners were cleaned from glue residues and the old gaffer tape was consolidated. Recto and close ups of the four corners after conservation and restoration. Finally, the frame was undusted, the glass cleaned, and the frame reassembled. The artwork returned stable to the gallery as soon as possible as the exhibition was ongoing. In conclusion, this was another challenging conservation assignment. The mounting of the photograph with nails onto a plywood was until now an unknown method that evoked a tailored-made conservation strategy. On the transportation back to the gallery, 
two earth handlers were needed in order to keep the frame horizontally, distributing the weight homogeneously. Further instructions were given for the future storage and transportation of the artwork to stay horizontal, recto side face up. Thank you all very much for your attention. Hope you enjoyed the flight. Um, thank you for that, Adia. Um, so our next and final talk is from Nicholas. Um, and this talk is on the conservation of a cased panotype on leather. So if you want to share your screen again, Nicholas. Okay. Thank you. And now I show the beginning. From beginning, yeah, there we go. Earlier this year, a small group of cased images came into the MCS Studio of Conservation. It included two panotypes on leather, one of which forms the subject for this talk. The panotype process had some popularity, popularity from the 1850s for a decade or two. The process involves producing a wet clothing image on glass, separating it from the glass and transferring it to a black oilcloth support, or more rarely, paper or leather. Sometimes a double transfer is used, sometimes a single. The image is sometimes varnished or coated. The main advantage of the process is the removal of the fragile glass. Panotypes could therefore be safely posted or dropped without risk. Some photographers claim that panotypes would last longer. This panotype is by John Stewart, 1831 to 1907, of 120 Buchanan Street, Glasgow in Scotland. Stuart moved to his Buchanan Street studio in 1859, providing a nice cut-off point for dating. In this case, the main problem was that part of the image was stuck to the glass. This was visually disturbing. I considered leaving it as it was, but as the group is privately owned, there was a significant chance that in the future a member of the family would try to separate the two. I frequently find that owners have had a go at separation before bringing such images to me. In this case, there was a little separation from the leather, of the leather from the collodion around the edges um, of the adhered area, but this was probably due to movement of the leather in response to the environment. Heat and cold have been used to help separate images, as well as immersion and baths that start to dissolve the glass. All can be effective. I didn't want to use heat as this could adversely affect the cellulose nitrate and the leather. Cold would probably encourage the emulsion to separate from the leather rather than from the glass. Wet treatments were out due to the adverse effect on the old leather. What did I do? Well, the leather was reasonably flexible, so using a blade to physically separate the two was possible. I used a knife made from an old hacksaw blade and ground on just one side. Not every hacksaw blade is suitable. It has to be tempered all the way through, not just along the teeth. Grinding on just one side is important as it allows the blade to be used at a low angle and still have the cutting edge in contact with the glass. The blade works best when frequently sharpened. Single-sided razor blades are not usable as these have a little metal ground off on the opposite side. So donning my optivisor, I started by flexing the leather to give access for the blade while holding down the adhered area. I didn't want the leather to pull away, leaving the image layer on the glass. I started below the face where there was a little flap of collagen that had already separated from the glass and worked steadily to separate the two. After removing the glass, I saw that the very last millimetre of collagen remained stuck to the glass. This area is already lifting when the photograph arrived with us, but a little more may have simply pinged off due to the flexing, despite my holding the leather down. Upon examining the separated photograph, the area that had been adhered was very flat and shiny, as is usually the case. It had been ferrotyped by the glass. There wasn't any need to treat this. The other notable feature was that the varnish or coating layer looked whitish due to the formation of tiny cracks. The refractive index of collodion is 1.5 to 1.3. Paroid B72 has a refractive index of 1.48 to 1.49. This is close enough that, that cracks filled with paroid B72 will disappear. A 10% solution of B72 in toluene was locally applied to fill the cracks by capillary action and the cracks disappeared. Paraloid B72 is also used to re-adhere a small area of lifting collodion. Removing the mat, 
revealed copper-based corrosion products on the underside of the mat and on the face of the photograph, well, in, in the margins. These have been caused by partial wetting of the case in the past. The bulk of these deposits were removed by swabbing with industrial methylated spirit. The mat didn't look very different after treatment, despite many discoloured swabs, but the photograph showed a marked difference. The treated areas on the underside of the mat were then coated with parallel B72 in toluene. Where the closure was missing, the black surface beneath showed through. This was locally retouched with Windsor and Newton watercolours with gum arabic added to increase the gloss and increase reversibility. The glass was cleaned with deionized water and IMS. The glass, mat, photograph and preserver were then reassembled, folding the metal back in the same order as it had been previously. The assemblage was then returned to the case. Some lifting leather along the hinge was re-adhered with Clusel G in IMS. The sharper-eyed members of the audience have probably noticed that the case could do us some more repair. Unfortunately, this was one of those budget-restricted jobs where we could not carry out every treatment that we'd recommended. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nicholas. That was a really lovely treatment. Um, so now we have time for our final questions. Um, there is one in the chat already, but yes, adding them if you have more or raise your hand. Um, so the first one in the chat was for Mohammed. It's from uh, Louisa Casella um, asking, how is the negative secured in the front? Well, it's easy. Uh, well, it's secured because, uh, well, I didn't. I don't get the question. Do you mean when you open the housing, or you displaying, or you just mean uh, securing inside the housing itself? Inside the housing itself. Yeah, inside the housing itself. Because uh, actually, the 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 how the the negative itself, it's totally fit inside. Um, you know the um, the the. Uh, the the place all right so there's no room for moving uh the the, the glass plate right this one this is two this is for for like the 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 small sizes but for for the large sizes i added uh also like uh something supportive uh, f uh just to put uh, out uh, on the top of your of the glass plate so when you move the glass plate the glass plate will not move well i have a video if i if you want i can share with you but um if you would like i can share with you to can show you my testing uh you know for the safety of the for that of that glass all right so Sarah, do we have time to share one more video? Um, would you maybe be able to add it into the chat? Could you put a could you sort of because, post it into the chat? Well, I don't have it. I don't have any link for, for the video. So if you how, how long is the video? It's like one minute or something. Well, I can I can like uh, you know um um like do it fast mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah, that's so fine. Yeah, yeah. All right. So hold on for a second. Can we do it later? Because yeah, maybe sure. I, Let's, we've, yeah, we've got a few other questions we can answer. Yeah, you can right. look for it. Another question um, from Luisa Casella. Mm -hmm. uh, to Adia, um, thank you, Adia. Are you concerned about excessive pressure in the top corners? Uh, Adia? Okay, I will. I will try to answer yeah. me. <laughs> I'm in the chat. Uh, uh, the conservation uh, everything was stabilized all the corners whether they were torn or creased or not uh, as you saw you saw i stabilized all the other uh, left corners that were not uh, torn uh, 
but the problem uh, of the tearing was that the uh, uh, frame so the weight uh, pr um, provoked uh, all this damage uh, so i gave um, instructions that after the uh, uh, the exhibition uh, the frame should be stored horizontal because yes it, uh, for a long time for a long time uh, you know for many years uh, hanged i don't know maybe it will uh, have problems so for now i think it's stabilized if it's hanged uh, correctly and uh, stored uh, correctly i hope i answer <laughs> thanks sadia <laughs> okay um Rasha suggested like uh, Mohammed if you can if you want to share your contact details on the um, on the chat and maybe like uh, you can send out like or people can reach you if they want to see the the system the uh, system. Uh, uh, you mean uh, hold on for a second okay do you, you mean uh, okay all right why if you okay. just if you just um would write like the, the contact details your email on the chat and people can get in touch with you if they want to yes yes them. yes yes i will but uh, oh, the, the uh, all right okay just uh, um, also if we if we don't have any more questions specifically for this session we could ask some of the earlier questions that we didn't have time for well, okay, so I I don't know if there's something for sh okay sh chat. Um, there's actually another question. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, Mohammed, I'm just going to ask this question to Nicholas that's in the chat. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. Um, uh, it's from Louisa. Um, excellent presentation. Sorry to be daft, but which side do you place in the blade angle and which side flat? The um, the bevel was um, towards the photograph, and the the flat um, unground side was against the glass. Um, if I was to clean the other side, the other side of the um, the knife has a sort of blue paint coating on it. So if I was to clean that off with some solvent, I could use it either way round. Um, provided you've ground the the um, cutting edge straight enough, yeah, um, it doesn't um, doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's important to keep sharpening it as you go. Even though this was only a small area, the size of a, you know, well, I suppose it was about um, well less than twenty millimeters across. Um, uh, you can. Um, I had to sharpen it several several times, and um, and also you can um, you can sort of move around and do a little bit and a little bit. So um, you're not using the whole of the blade. Um, trying to think what else would uh, be Louise, interesting. Louisa Louis wanted to know how do you sharpen it. Oh, how do I sharpen it? Um, well, I have a, a block of wood that I glued some fabric to, and then I just put some polishing compound on that. Um, and um, uh, yes, I mean, any sort of really fine abrasive would sharpen it. I mean, the, the first thing I ground, I ground the, um, the edge first of all on an oil stone. And um, if you use a guide, that will actually um, help you to keep it nice and nice and straight. Um, but once I'd, I'd gone through a couple of grades of oil stone, I then went on to the um, fabric covered wooden stick. And um, it, yeah, it seems to work pretty well. And it only takes a few a few wipes of the stick to uh, you know put that really razor sharp edge back on. Um, and another question for you, Nicholas, from Alexandros. I was wondering whether the repair will the repair with Paraloid B seventy two retains a sort of flexibility after drying to withstand possible leather movements. Ah, well, that's a very good question. Um, the uh, the, the area that was lifting that I stuck down with Parallel B72 was so small that um, uh, I don't think flexibility over that small an area of leather is, is going to be a problem. Um, if it was a larger area, then 
Yeah, possibly so, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what I would use if it was a larger area, but fortunately in this case, I didn't have to think about it. <laughs> it was only a small area, so. Um, do we have time for a few more questions, Yanis? Um, <laughs> We've got a couple maybe more. Maybe a couple of more, a couple of more. And two then we two can more? Have a break. Yes, two more, and then we can have a break till uh, half past 12, and then we can uh, go over to the ATM. Um, so there's a question for Mohammed from uh, Dominic Wall. If the negative is in many pieces, sorry, uh, you, your voice just went out. Can, can you read the question? Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. um, it's uh, if the negative is in many pieces. Can you yeah. fix them together before placing yeah, the yeah, negative? Yeah, folder? yeah, of course, because if you just notice for uh, the first negative that I showed in the video was broken into pieces. So all were together, and but, but you have to add in, in, in the layer between uh, some filmo tapes so, so you just avoid any uh, contraction between the classes. So you will be totally secure. And I have my video uh, ready if you want me to show it. Can we? Um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, it's just a minute, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay. If you want to share your screen, Mohammed. Yeah, I will. I, will. <laughs> I am doing it now. Okay, just uh, hold it for a second. Just hold it for a second. All right. I don't know what is. Sorry, just. That's okay. Maybe um, we've got one more question, so maybe we'll ask that in the meantime. Yeah, maybe you answer one one more question, and I will get it ready. Yeah. All right. So um, yeah. Uh, Last question is from uh, Megan Smith. Question for presenters of albums. As photo conservators, how often are you asked to work with binding and how do you straddle that material difference? Kind of a question for lots of people. <laughs> I don't know who wants to answer that. I think it depends really on the, it, 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 it's a combination of, um, sometimes if you are likely to be in an institution that they also have like there are also book conservators. I mean, I have personally um, get advice, have gotten advice from book, cons book conservators as well uh, when I have to treat it like albums. But, um, I think it, it, it depends really um, on how far do you want to go with the conservation and um, yeah, what is what is the end result if, if you're really um, are hoping to make the album again like fully functional or if you just want to conserve like its structure as it is and like stabilize the photographs um, it really depends i don't know if um, anyone else has nothing something else to add no one okay Oh, we've got um, a response on the chat from Sarah Allen. Um, and she says, I'm often asked to work on albums and so I have to develop a really close working relationship with an amazing book conservator. Um, yeah, I agree. That's it. similar for me as well, is that um, in the past, it's just working really closely with book conservators. Um, yeah. Um, I think uh, maybe at this point, uh, so Mohammed, uh, are you still want to share the video? Uh, I'm just aware of uh, maybe we should go for a break because we have the ATM um, as next one. Do you do you want to do it now, or maybe you can? Sorry, we cannot hear you. So you mean after the break, I can show the video? Um, after the break, we have the AGM. I wonder if it's maybe like best if someone wants to um, uh, look at the video more in detail. You can share the video with them through email. You, I saw you, you posted your email on the chat, so maybe that's like more.
convenient because we need to go for a break and then like at half past 11 to start our AGM. It's okay. So it's, 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 it's okay. I can, uh, I can tell whatever he wants to see the, the video. I yeah. can share with the, with yeah, the maybe that. Okay. You already have my email. <laughs> Or, or I can have, I have it on uh, YouTube, so I can leave the link. Oh, yes, please do post the link yes. uh, on yes. the chat. That would be more convenient, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that I didn't know you have a YouTube link, then that works perfectly. Uh, all right, I, I would do about that. Um, so I think at that point, uh, well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and thanks for the questions and the speakers as well. Uh, we're so grateful for sharing your experience and uh, your um, uh, your projects, your amazing projects. Um, please do stay for the AGM um, at uh, in about like ten minutes. And um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, thanks for uh, joining as well for the um, annual group meeting. So um, I'm going to uh, pass the microphone to uh, Marta, who is going to, who is the, our new chair uh, of the Icon Photographic Materials Group, and she's going to be giving us a few updates um, about the group, and uh, then each of us, each, each one of them, the, the group members are going to chipping in. So, Marta? Thank you, Yanis. First of all, thank you to everybody for attending the conference. Um, I just, I'm feel full of joy seeing this happening and having so many of us gathering together again. Might not be in person, but I think that this is by far more than we had a few years ago. And especially seeing people from so many different countries and continents. Um, Colin from Hong Kong is pitch black already here. And we have people from West Africa, the States, Europe. So this is a really wonderful thing to see how our group is evolving and growing. Um, so to start with, um, I have to say, I am the new chair for the Icon Photographics Material Group. Um, I took the position approximately four months ago. And that is, thank you, Jonas. Uh, I'm taking over our former chair, Jacqueline Moon, who was leading the group for six years and is the one that put the most of us together uh, within this group. And I believe that we, we won a lot uh, with her leadership. I also saw that we have Dominique Wall in the conference today. And Dominique was the treasurer at the time that I joined the group. So thank you, Dominique. We are trying to follow up with the legacy here. Um, so that will be the highest news. Uh, we want to say a big thank you to Jacqueline for all the work that she has done. And I'm just hoping that I can keep leading the group uh, in the direction that we believe that it deserves. Um, on the rest of the committee, until this point, we don't have big changes. So the current, the current structure of the group has uh, myself as the chair. Then we have Ioannis Vasayev as the event coordinator. Uh, Jordan Megary is our treasurer, Vanessa Torres secretary, and Stephanie Jameson's communication officer. Um, as you have seen today, we are all multitasking a little bit. Um, so Jordan is also helping with communication, Stefan is helping with events because we are slightly short of group members. So with that, um, I want to say that our goals for the upcoming years is to increase the group members within the committee and to open up to having someone in top communications officer, social media editor in that line, someone working with events coordinator slash IT because everything is going online at this point. We are saying that we have a big online presence and conferences are online to so try to ease up uh, that section of our outreach and work. Um, we are thinking in getting someone for development officer and I will further that a little bit yeah, more at the end. And then a student liaison officer. Um, what we did realize when the chair position came up is that the um, number of applicants for the committee members is not as high as we would like it to be at the moment. Um, thereby, we would like to encourage everybody that is here or people that you might know um, to consider applying for these positions when they come up. We are not expecting people that is fully trained and super professional that will know how to do everything. We are a group of conservators that gather together and we try to push the field forward. We are learning by doing. Um, 
and I think that we have a really nice community. So please, if positions come through, please consider it. Um, space and distance is not a problem either. Um, so I think that the main points that I can speak about in the general terms are those ones. I will pass the word to our secretary first, Jordan, then Ioannis will speak a little bit about the events uh, from this 22, 23 year, and then Stephanie will add a little bit about the communication of the group. So with that, Jordan, do you want to take it? Yes, thank you. Um, so it's going to be a very short update um, from me as the treasurer, um, because this is our first and only event this year. Um, we haven't held a previous one, although we hope to change that in the coming years and be a bit busier. Um, so we started off the year with the £1,000 allocation from ICON, which all the groups now get. So um, just in case anyone wasn't aware of this, but before it was worked out on how many um, specific speciality members sign, when you sign up for your ICON membership, if you signed up to as um, for photograph materials group to be your primary membership, um, kind of a certain amount that came to us, whereas now each group is equal and we all get a £1,000 at the start of the year. So we got that and we haven't had to put that towards any events so far. This is obviously three events we've put on, but if for non-ICOM members, this event was £10, so we will get a bit of money um, kind of generated from that. And um, anything that we don't spend at the end of the financial year goes back into ICOM's pot. Um, to go towards all their activities that they need funding for. Um, but yeah, that's my update for this year. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks. Johannes, would you like to tell us a little bit about the bands? Yes. So, um, first of all, again, thank you very much, everyone, for um, joining us today. So hopefully we will keep this event going um, on a yearly basis. Uh, I mean, I have to admit, like we we hadn't done it for a year. Like last year was a bit of like restructuring of the group, so we missed the previous year. Um, but hopefully we're gonna keep doing it, and as we as we as we go along, uh, we, we will refine it essentially and make sure that we run it more like maybe smoothly um, and. And also because like there the, the were there were a few like let's say uh, logistic things that we want to kind of um, potentially make better for the next one, and considering we haven't done it like for for like two years, this type of events, and then um, hopefully um, I would like to also uh, uh, the committee I mean to introduce like more um, a seminar or like talk based um, online events. Uh, uh, particular like subjects that we would like to address and um, maybe we would like your feedback on that if there is like a, a, a particular challenge or issue that you are more concerned like everywhere in the world like that's why we're so happy that we have people from Egypt as well uh, um, uh, joining us and we would be even more even even happier if we have even like other people from other parts of the world and um, so anything that's kind of concern and then um, Maybe we can sort of kind of source um, uh, different people that are specialized in um, particular areas and that can contribute with like specific, uh, like based, let's say like a, an event specialized only for this type of issue. Um, and we would welcome that. So we de definitely like if you have any anything to suggest, any feedback, um, we would like to hear it. And um, I mean, potentially, uh, we would like to do some more uh, in-person events. Uh, so we are in the process of uh, having talks about it and like developing potential um, uh, workshops. Uh, again, if you have anything to suggest, um, uh, let us know. Um, I think that uh, that's for now. Thank you, Johannes. That's great work as well. Um, and then we have Steph, who is our communication officer slash event support. Um, do we have? Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so uh, the communication is just a reminder you can get in touch with us um, via our email, which is phmgicon at gmail.com. That should also be on our group page on the icon website. 
um, and also Facebook on our Facebook group, which is just Icon Photographic Materials Group. Um, also the blog, uh, that's been quite quiet for the last year. The last post was uh, end of last year, but we'd really like to get that going again. Um, so please do send submissions to us um, via our email. Um, we particularly like ones from the speakers, so we'll be getting in touch with the speakers about those. Um, but yeah, ideally in over next year, 2023, it'd be great to have blog posts every couple of months like we did in the past um, and just like really get it going again and have more of a dialogue with our, our members there. So yeah, I think that's that's everything from me. Thank you, Steph. Um, okay, and then we have Vanessa there who say that she won't say much, but she's um, there and she's also an incredible part of, of this group. So this is the all of us at this point. Um, so after a short review of the work that we have done this year, um, I want to share with you a bit of the ideas that we have for the upcoming year, and um, especially how much we would like to have your collaboration and contributions. Um, as you all know, like the majority of the work that we've been doing, I was current, I was the former events coordinator from 2016 to 2019. So that's the area that I was getting more involved with in the Icon Photographic Materials Group. Now we did, I think that we did pick up a good uh, flow with events, right? Like we were doing one workshop in traditional or more historical photographic conservation, something more in contemporary. And then we have the round tables now moved to a lighting talk as Johan spoke. Uh, an area that we realized that we might have been focusing a lot and we would like to expand further. Now, we don't know exactly what area we should expand further. And that's where we would like to, to ask for your support. Most probably if, um, yeah, we, we have Michael as well here. So we will ask for the contact of all the people that is subscribed to the photographic materials group. And we will share a survey with you in the short future, asking for what are the areas that you would like us to work further. It doesn't have to be event related. It could be areas of research. It could be um, project based. Um, when I apply for the third position, something that it was really behind my mind, it was the salaries that photographic conservators have. What is the disparity with other fields and what is the availability of jobs for photographic conservators as a proper specialization? So we can actually look further than just creating events and we can work on how do we make our profession grow further to get better recognition and interlink with other meal, uh, fields of heritage conservation. Um, so thereby, that's where the event, uh, the development officer position will also come really handy because we will need someone to help us analyze the data that we will collect and we will be able to start moving in one direction or the other. Um, but mainly all of us here are doing this because we believe in photographic conservation and we believe that our role is to support our community. So feel free to really reach to us. And um, I don't think that, yeah, we will do as much as, as much as we can. The survey hopefully will be short. We won't take much time, but I strongly encourage all of you to, to be part of this group and to engage with us as much as we can. And we will do our best to give back um, to ICON. So I think that from my side, this is all. Um, we can open the floor for the Q&A related with the group. So if someone wants to do any question, please go ahead. Uh, I got a question. Hi. It's the same question I have every year. Can Tell we me. see the annual accounts, please? Yes. So actually, this is a really good point. Uh, and Michael might be able to say more about the whole icon part. From our side, the majority of the things that we just spoke now, um, I'm following the great example of the book and paper conservator group that Michael sent. Um, we have a small report where we have the description of what I just mentioned, the treasury uh, events and so on. And our idea is to send everybody, to send this document to everybody that is part of the photographic materials group. Um, mm. So I think that uh, Jordan, can we include that? Like, yeah, yeah, sure. So I think um, what we'll do is we'll end, we'll wait until the end of the financial year, and then we'll have the complete numbers. Yeah, and we'll include that. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. 
because that will Thank be, you. and also, as Joanne say, we are hoping there might be a small surplus from this conference uh, because some of the tickets for non icon mem members were 10 pounds. So there will be a small difference there. Michael, something that we should add in this area? I don't think so. I think it's really good policy to write a short document setting out your annual report for the year. It's really transparent, something for future committee members, of course, to refer to, and a good record of your successes over the last year. So really helpful to send that to members, and that can simply go out by iConnect and then be added to the website. And I know some other groups are starting to do such things as well. So I think it's a really good idea. Perfect. Thank you. Any additional questions? Suggestions? Suggestions are incredibly welcome. I'm learning by doing here. Okay. I maybe I just want to add that um, on top of um, about the survey, Marta, I think I would like to also address the uh, the fact that there is like no photograph conservation course in the UK. Um, so this is something that I would I would like to kind of address um, through through the group, and um, I I don't know the solution. I don't know what like what should be done. Like maybe more workshops or more outreach activity. Um, but this is something that I would like to explore. Um, Let's try to speak to universities and see if this can act. Yeah, like exactly. When you prepare professional. Right, like there is, I'm I'm seeing your talks, and there is so many people that could teach so much, if a platform for teaching was created. So, I think that that's what Icon is here for as well to help us find these gaps and and have a whole support. It's not just us; it's the whole Icon institution. So uh, maybe like with the surgery, we would we could kind of kind of like incorporate that element as well. I don't know how we would like to structure the survey. We can have like you know. Um, a thought, a proper like thought about it, and like start building it up. See what questions we would like to would like people to get responses and suggestions to. Um, but this is just another thing that I would like to somehow investigate and explore and address through the group. Thanks, um, so Dominic. First, and then Michael. Hi, uh, hello. Um, um, Hi, Marta, Hello. everybody. Um, I wanted to suggest, uh, if possible, please, that we uh, have a meeting on cold storage. Now, actually, in fact, um, cold storage is, is, is the more I kind of know about it, um, the, uh, the, the, the easier it is, actually. Uh, you know, the, the, well, the easier it might be, but um, but anyway, it'd be good to share information on it. And and yeah, we, we had a meeting on it in 2007, but that was a long time ago. And it would be good to um, to kind of um, get it, you know, see more current practice, please, if yeah. possible. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and um, I you to yes. Um, there's some interesting points there that dovetail with some work that Patrick has been doing as part of the skills team. I was going to drop some links into the chat in case anybody hasn't seen them. We've just issued a new report on conservation salaries with some benchmarks based on fresh data. Um, and these, of course, are for the wider sector, not just photographic materials, but it might be an interesting way to start thinking about salaries and what you might do to perhaps add to that with greater specificity for photographic materials. There was also, uh, less recently, last summer, um, we published our latest conservation labor market intelligence report. Um, so if I drop these in the chat, hopefully they'll make interesting reading. And I know Patrick would be very keen to hear um, about further suggestions to make this a bit more specific and more useful and to figure out what to do with it. Um, and a final suggestion there was that um, I know Patrick's very active trying to set up internships for underrepresented conservation specialisms when there isn't a training course. And we've had some success recently with I think stained glass had a recent one when there's perhaps a dearth of training positions available. Um, so it might always be interesting to consider if perhaps Patrick and the skills team can help to facilitate an internship that would provide some training opportunities for young conservators there. Um, so yeah, I'll drop some things in the chat. Hopefully they're helpful. Yes, please, Michael. That would be great. Thank you so much. I can't say like I 
I started with infotrophic consultation thanks to the Icon internship, and I went the year behind Johannes, and Johannes, Johannes was with Nicolas as well, right? Um, so I think that it's a really, really a strong platform uh, to allow yeah. development within the profession. And then the networks are just incredible. What can I say about that? Um, but I think that all these platforms that Icon can offer for growth, um, we should try to maximize them. Thank you. Okay, Victoria is saying something. I think there have already been some multi discussion between book and paper group on photographic materials and potential change tax and workshop that could cross over between a specialist. So we would also love to hear if there's any idea that anyone has that, sorry, just move to feel in this class between a specialist. So what I can say, hi, Victoria, thank you for, thank you for mentioning that. Um, so I did join the last big icon event where all the chairs were present a few, a month and a half ago, I will say. And um, I had the pleasure of meeting the new book and paper conservator, uh, the chair of the group. We briefly spoke about that. Um, he, I mentioned that I was happy to see if we could reach with any other uh, group that we can find similarities with. And the book and paper group was the first one um, written also saying that it will be great to explore our options. Now, we haven't done that yet because we were pushing through the creation of this event, but it's in the pipeline. So it's good to know that there is some interest. If you have any idea about areas where you can see that there is more bridge, we were before speaking about the albums, for example. So I already see that there are things that are building up. Um, we definitely will explore them. They are really a strong group and they are actually really focused. So I think that we can also learn a lot from, from them. Great. Yeah, any additional final comments? Because you guys probably have to go for lunch. I have to go for dinner here. <laughs> quite late yes, for you. Can I speak, please? Yes, yes, of course. Of course. Um, Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, if you uh, if you hold a workshop, please didn't uh, don't uh, forget Egyptian because we have uh, in Egypt many 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 uh, photographs, many albums. Uh, it's back to uh, the beginning of the 19th century, and there is a few co photograph conservator. Uh, I try with my colleagues to. Uh, um to have an experience uh, uh, for example italian experience i was last uh, last month in the ccr in the italy i uh, got the draw study the conservation in photographs and binding also uh, so uh, if you will doing an uh, workshop please share uh, share it with us and they can uh, share it with my colleagues uh, also, uh, I hope for all uh, to visit Egypt and see the uh, the collection there in many museums there. Uh, and thank you, so thank you for this opportunity again. Can I ask you, Sarah? Is there is there official like um, photograph conservation course in in Egypt? Um, yes, 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 yes. Ah, there is. is okay. Yes, some, some. I uh, doing that. Uh, I hold uh, an uh, one in many museums. Uh, sorry, I, I hold a, a, a workshop in uh, conservation of photographs in uh, many museums in Egypt, uh, also in uh, Union of Arabs. Uh, but I want, uh, uh, but I want uh, an English experience or a different types uh, of uh, preserving. Uh, for example, um, about the biodeterioration, it's a big problem. It's a, it's a biodeterioration in the photographs, especially gelatin. Ah, uh, biodegradation, okay. Yes, yes, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, actually, I didn't know how could I solve this problem. Uh, I contact with my friends in Leiden University. Uh, she, uh, Clara, I don't know you know them uh, here. Yes, no. yes, of course. Yes, yes, yes. She asked me to do some uh, some steps to to uh, avoid the uh, spurt of this this deterioration. 
in the collection. So I want to make exchange of, uh, of, 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 of experience. Yeah, you get the point? Yeah, yeah, that absolutely, was, absolutely. Yeah. And okay. it's interesting also to see that, that because I, I, I assume like the environment and the, the climate in, in Egypt is yes. um, uh, kind of favors more bio biological degradation. So it, it's an issue that maybe it's like a bit less here. So, you know, it could be like a both way, like we learn from you, like it's not, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like a both way. Because like definitely the, the ways that you are implementing in order to um, to deal with this problem, you know, we might not really in here in the UK have it in the same scale. So um, yeah, yeah, definitely like it's a both way. But... I hope that. I Thank you. Know. Thank you for this opportunity. Yes, I, I'm really course, happy. Yes, yes. We are delighted. I think that that's our whole goal, right? To keep building our community and to know that we have support with each other. Yeah. Like we will face many challenges and there is that much that one single person can learn by themselves. But when we put all our brains together, like in these little talks, uh, we can really reach by far, uh, far away. So um, from my side, I think that that was everything. Um, thank you very much for being part of the group, for participating, for giving your time. Um, we look forward to hearing your ideas for that coming year and we will try to keep doing our best to support the community. Um, and definitely big thanks to all the committee members that have made this year happen and the events. They are magnificent. I can tell you that, guys. So Thank, thank you all, guys. Thank you, Marta. And uh, thanks to all the speakers and everyone who joined. It's great. Yeah. Thank you so much.